So the weird thing is we don't exist in the physical world. We do exist inside of a story that the brain tells itself. Basically, a brain cannot feel anything. A neuron cannot feel anything. They're physical things. Physical systems are unable to experience anything. But it would be very useful for the brain or for the organism to know what it would be like to be a person and to feel something. Yeah. So the brain creates a simulacrum of such a person that it uses to model the interactions of the person. It's the best model of what that brain, this organism, thinks it is in relationship to its environment. So it creates that model. It's a story, a multimedia novel that the brain is continuously writing and updating. You said in a recent conversation that, quote, some people think that a simulation can't be conscious and only a physical system can, but they got it completely backward. A physical system cannot be conscious. Only a simulation can be conscious. Yeah. Consciousness is a simulated property of the simulated self. Just, just like you said, the mind is kind of the, 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 we'll call it story, narrative. There's a simulation, in our, so our mind is essentially a simulation. Uh, usually um, I try to use the terminology so that the mind is basically the principles that produce the simulation. It's the software that is implemented by your brain. Yeah. And the mind is creating both the universe that we are in and the self, the uh, idea of a person that is on the other side of attention and is embedded in this world. Why is that important, that idea of a self? Uh, why is that an important feature in the simulation? It's basically a result of um, the purpose that the mind has. It's a tool for modeling, right? We are not actually monkeys. We are side effects of the regulation needs of monkeys. And what the monkey has to regulate is uh, the relationship of an organism to an outside world that is in large part also consisting of other organisms. And as a result, it basically has regulation targets that it uh, tries to get to. These regulation targets start with priors. They're basically like unconditional reflexes that we are more or less born with. And then we can reverse engineer them to make them more consistent. And then we get more detailed models about how the world works and how to interact with it. And so, uh, so these priors that you commit to are largely target values that our needs should approach, set points. And this deviation to the set point creates some urge, some tension. And we find ourselves living inside of feedback loops, right? The consciousness emerges over dimensions of disagreements with the universe. Things where you care, where things are not the way they should be, where you need to regulate. And so in some sense, the sense itself is the result of all the identifications that you're having. And identification is a regulation target that you're committing to. It's a dimension that you care about, that you think is important. And this is also what locks you in if you uh, let go of these commitments of these identifications, you get free. There's nothing that you have to do anymore. And if you let go of all of them, you're completely free and you can enter nirvana because you're done. I, I understand you're kind of, the self is an important part of the simulation, but why does the simulation feel like something? So if you look at a book by say George R. R. Martin, where the characters have plausible psychology. Yeah. And they stand on a hill uh, because they want to conquer the city below the hill and they've done it and they look at the color of the sky and they are apprehensive and feel uh, empowered and all these things. Why do they have these emotions? It's because it's written into the story, right? And it's written into the story because it's an adequate model of the person that predicts what they're going to do next. And the same thing is happen uh, uh, too fast. So it's basically a story that our brain is writing. It's not written in words. It's written in uh, perceptual content, basically multimedia content. And it's a model of what the person would feel if it existed. So it's a virtual person. <laughs> and you and me happen to be this virtual person. So this virtual person gets access to the language center and talks about the sky being blue. So like, I mean, what happens when you die to your mind simulation? Um, my implementation ceases. So basically the thing that implements myself will no longer be present. This, the, the weird thing is I don't actually have an identity beyond the identity that I construct. Identity is a software state. It's a construction. It's not physically real. You, you have, identity is not a physical concept. It's basically a representation of different objects on the same world line. It's a representation that you can get agency over if you care. So basically you can choose what you identify with if you want to. And I think that the fear of death only plays a role uh, as long as you don't see the big picture. The thing is that minds are software states, right? Software doesn't have identity. Software in some sense is a physical law. We don't have continuous existence. How do you know that? Like that? Because like... it's not computable. Because <laughs> you're saying it's good. There is no continuous infinite. process. The only thing that binds you together with the Lex Friedman from yesterday is the illusion that you have memories about him. 
So right. if you want to upload, it's very easy. You make a machine that thinks it's you. Because this is the same thing that you are. You are a machine that thinks it's you. You can uh, stop being afraid of your mortality because you realize you were never, never continuously existing in the first place. You can turn off yourself, you know. I can't turn you off You can't turn myself. it off. You can't turn it off. I can. Yes. So in the, you can basically meditate yourself in a state where you are still conscious, where still things are happening, where you know everything that you knew before, but you're no longer identified with changing anything. And... This means that yourself in, in a way dissolves. There is no longer this person. You you know that this person construct exists in other states and it runs on the, this brain of Lex Friedman, yeah. but it's it's not a real thing. It's a construct. It's an idea. And you can change that idea. And if you let go of this idea, if you don't think that you are special, you realize it's just one of many people and it's not your favorite person even, right? It's just one of many. Yeah. And it's the one that you are doomed to control for the most part. And that is basically informing the actions of this organism yeah. as a control model. And this is all there is. And you are somehow afraid that this control model gets interrupted or uh, loses the identity of continuity. I think that meditation is eventually just a bunch of techniques that let you control attention. And when you can control attention, you can get access to your own source code, hopefully not before you understand what you're doing. And then you can change the way it works temporarily or permanently. So yeah, meditation is to get, get a glimpse at the source code, get under, the, so basically yeah, control the, or the entire turn thing off is the attention. that you learn to control attention. So yeah. everything else is downstream from controlling attention. Maybe we can even step back and ask the question of what is consciousness to be sort of more systematic? Like what, what, what do you, how do you think about Consciousness. I what think is that consciousness? consciousness is largely a model of the contents of your attention. It's a mechanism that has evolved for a certain type of learning. What we do is an attention-based learning. We pinpoint the probable region in the network where we uh, can make an improvement. And then uh, we store the this binding state together with the expected outcome in a protocol. And this ability to make indexed memories for the purpose of learning, to revisit these uh, commitments later, this requires and memory of the contents of our attention. Another aspect is when I construct my reality, I make mistakes. So I see things that turn out to be reflections or shadows and so on, which means I have to be able to point out which features of my perception gave rise to a, a, a present construction of reality. So the system needs to pay attention to the uh, features that are currently in its focus. And it also needs to pay attention to whether it pays attention itself, in part because the attentional system gets trained with the same mechanism, so it's reflexive, but also in part because your attention lapses if you don't pay attention to the attention itself. <laughs> right? So it's the thing that I'm currently seeing just a, a dream that my brain has spun off into some kind of daydream, or am I still paying attention to my percept? So you have to periodically go back and see whether you're still paying attention. And if you have this loop and you make it tight enough between the system becoming aware of the contents of its attention and the fact that it's paying attention itself and makes attention the object of its attention, I think this is the loop over which we wake up. So do you think suffering is fundamental to happiness along no, these lines? Suffering is the result of caring about things that you cannot change. And if you are able to change what you care about to those things that you can change, you will not suffer. But would then would you then be able to experience happiness? Yes, but happiness itself is not important. The happiness is a cookie that your brain bakes for itself. It's not made by the environment. The environment cannot make you happy. It's your appraisal of the environment that makes you happy. And if you can change your appraisal of the environment, which you can learn to, then you can create arbitrary states of happiness. And some meditators fall into this trap. So they discover the room, this basement room in their brain where the cookies are made, and they indulge in stuff themselves. <laughs> and after a few months, it gets really old and the big crisis of meaning comes. <laughs> because they thought before that their, their unhappiness was the result of not being happy enough. So they fixed this, right? They can release the neurotransmitters at will if they train. And th uh, then the crisis of meaning pops up at an, a deeper layer. At the end of all this, let me then ask that same question. What is that, the answer to that? What could the possible answer be of the meaning of life? What, it, what could an answer be? What is it to you? The purpose of life in the sense is to um, produce complexity. And the complexity allows you to harvest neck entropy gradients that you couldn't harvest without the complexity. And in this sense, intelligence and life are very strongly connected because the purpose of intelligence is to allow control under conditions of complexity. So basically, you shift the boundary between the ordered systems into the 
uh, realm of the uh, of chaos. You build bridgeheads into chaos with complexity. And this is what we are doing. This is not necessarily a deeper meaning. I think the meaning that we have priors for, that we evolved for, outside of the priors, there is no meaning. Meaning only exists if a mind projects it, right? Yeah, uh, the That is probably civilization. I think that what feels most meaningful to me is to try to build and maintain a sustainable civilization. 